Um, you mean lately or in general? In general, in general. He went away. David, David, you scared, you scared, scared him off. <laughs> I scared him off. I guess he went to go see. <laughs> I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm about to do a bit of whining here because down here tonight, we're getting about three arc seconds. And I'm saying, come on. <laughs> this is no good. That's, That's why you're moving away from there, right? That's right. We can't do any worse moving back up there. <laughs> You could, because it's snowing up here. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. yeah. I forgot about that. But I mean, in general, in general. Sorry, you're here, I, uh, must have closed the window accidentally. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the scene is, is pretty good, um, but not spectacular. So what's, what's pretty good and what's not spectacular? Well, I'm just judging from the the pictures I, I get of the planets. Yeah, they're, they're not uh, typically not fantastic. So would you say between two and a half and three, perhaps? Oh, the 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 Bortle? No, no, the the arc second scene. Oh, I'm um, I I'm I'm thinking within. Uh, two seconds, yeah, I yeah. would say, just judging from my photographs. That's pretty good. Where are you, David? In Maple Bay. In Maple up Bay. On halfway up Mount Zuhalem, I guess. <laughs> would you explain, so you explain to me what two or three arc seconds of seeing means, please, somebody? Okay, um, when you're taking pictures, <laughs> as you know, stars twinkle. And that's because the atmosphere acts like little waves in the top of a pool. So if you're laying in the bottom of a pool with little waves on it, everything up top is wiggling around. Same thing with us. The air is not smooth and the stars twinkle. And the RMS or the average value that that moves back and forth is measured in arc seconds, how far a star moves in a second from the sky. Ah. And then, so typically where I am down here, it's about two and a half arc seconds. And I'm not too happy about that. Last night I was getting about two arc seconds and I didn't get three arc seconds. So I was just wondering how Dave was doing because his his pictures of the, the Andromeda galaxy or we could see individual stars were nothing short of spectacular. So I was just wondering what your normal scene was, David. So arc seconds are just an angular measurement. Yeah, it's angular. Uh, how much is it moving? Yeah, I'm just judging from how well I can resolve the smallest things. Visually, it doesn't matter much because your eyes just staring at something and compensates for any image motion. But when you're using a camera or a sensor, yeah, and suddenly that star is moving around when you don't want it to. Yeah, for, for an reasons. example, if you've looked at the double-double, uh, the smaller doubles are about one and a half arc seconds apart, the mm -hmm. gap between. Yeah, so, so in other words, if the seeing wasn't appropriate, if you were imaging it, you wouldn't see two stars. Yeah. It might be just be a blur. Yeah. The double-double means in the Big Dipper? In yep. Ursa Major? Lyra, Lyra. Mira. In Lyra. Mira, yeah. There's a double a star thing. in Lyra that has is actually four stars. That's correct. Yeah. So when you don't have a lot of magnification, it looks like two stars, and then when you bump it up, there's two other ones. So it kind of looks like a little dumbbell. Mm -hmm. But the oddest part about it is they're they're not parallel to each other. They're kind of like at right angles to each other. Correct. The yeah. pair the pairs are at right, yeah. right angles to each other. 
the, the, the funny thing I get with double stars is even, you know, sometimes they, they overlap because of the seeing. Yes. And you'll get like, you'll get like. And they look this, elongated, right? They, they look like you well, have bad the, trailing. Not, not just elongated, but they'll actually have a dark line. Oh, right. We've talked about in, this before. In, in between them? Yeah. 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 So it's almost like someone took a marker and outlined the difference. And I think it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> I think it's just, just the way that it's, I think the seeing, if it wasn't for the seeing, they'd be resolved, but the seeing causes that dark line, I, I think. I, I think that's, that's a part of your brain processing what it's seeing, because I think your, your eyes and your brain see that little dark line and you might no, but not, we we we, we see this on imaging images though, right, yeah. Dave? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We see it on images as well, okay. not just. So, so maybe it is an artifact of, of the seeing because uh, I always thought yeah. it was. If, you, you know, if you stare at the the pair of stars, the tight stare mm -hmm. is long enough. You do see that little dark there, line. Sometimes. There's. Does anybody remember when we watch uh, planetary transits? The, the, there's that black drop effect when yeah. when the yeah. thing leaves the edge, the limb. There's this almost looks like it doesn't want to leave. It's got yeah. a teardrop shape. Maybe, maybe it's something to do with that when things are really close yeah, together. I sure saw that on the incoming on the Venus transit. But that's supposed to be a function of optics. Yeah. 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 And I would so say it's it not is. real. Yeah. Yeah. I, would, I think you're right. But, but I think this, like, you have like a little blurry black line in between the two lobes of like a undoubled star in right. the image. So they're probably waving. And so it's allowing a little bit of the black through because yeah. you're doing a prolonged exposure, right? And so it's gonna show some of that black, but not all of it. So it will be a, <coughs> a faint line kind of showing that's down the middle of them. I, I as think the stars shrink. Because they're shrinking and expanding with the scene. Hey, how about that the um, binary is so close together that they are waving not randomly with each other, but together so that when one is moving away, the other one is moving also so that you actually do have in every single moment, there actually is a dark patch between the two. It, it yeah, all depends that, how yeah. big the um, turbulent cells are, and, yes. you know, how yeah. angularly big they are. But yeah. the stars won't be wobbling. They'll be expanding and shrinking. That's right, yeah. Because that's the effect of the seeing. Because it's right. a thicker, so that's like a lens effect. So yeah. at that moment when they shrunk, they would allow a little bit of the light of the darkness to shine through. But then when they expand, it covers it. But that would keep building up on your timed exposure, right? Yeah. So it would you know, show you know, a little it would bit be, of the black. It would be an interesting <laughs> experiment to take a video on a night where the seeing varies. So you could actually go frame by frame and see what the differences were. But, and but I think Bell's explanation. I think Bell's mm -hmm. explanation also explains why your brain integrates those movements, and that's why sometimes you can see it. Because your when brain this, captures those moments when that little dark line is there. Because when the seeing is really, really bad, yeah. with a scope visually, the stars are all bloated. Yeah. 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 They're all just fat and weird. Like yeah. the other night when I was out with that little telescope and I was doing my little sketch of M42, but I had my reading glasses on and I forgot I had my reading glasses on and I stood up and I looked up at Orion it was such a strange effect. It was like a starry night kind of thing. All the stars, I could just see the, the main stars of Orion and they were just these huge white dots in the sky. And I kept, <laughs> and, and it caught me off guard and it's like, what's going on? And then I realized I had my reading glasses on and it was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I took them off and the stars all too, shrunk <laughs> down and I put them back. I kind of enjoyed it. I put them back on. I thought, this is really cool. <laughs> that, that's also a cataract effect. <laughs> yeah, but they were really, I could only yeah. see like the really main stars of Orion. So it was like this giant kind of like 
dot figure in the sky. It was it was interesting. I got time time to show a quick image of, of what I was talking about or sure. Well, why don't we get started and then because uh, it's um it is after 7:30. So um thank you. It's been a very interesting chat so far. And sure, let's have a look at that, uh, Dave. Uh, here's a big one right here. Um, can you see my mouse? Yep. Yeah. Can't zoom in on this any further than that, but you can see that line. Dave, Dave, kind of... Dave there's one there's one lower down, central, and about an inch from the bottom, I guess. Keep going. Get right there. You're just up above a little bit. Right there. Right there. The big one. The big one with a little one beside oh, there's, it. There's one right there. Yeah. Yeah. See how someone's looks like I could zoom in a little bit further in a different program, but you can see like someone's like someone's drawn a line. It's not circular. So it's not like one's you can tell what stars in front of the other one. But it's uh, anyways. Hmm. I think Bill's explanation makes sense. It does to me. I just couldn't yeah. describe yeah. it quite as well. Yeah. Very interesting. So Let's welcome everyone and uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, so what I have this evening was I wanted to just um, review next week because uh, it will be a bit different. Um, Joe has some um, photos uh, gathered from Antarctica, I believe. I think I've got that right. Uh, Randy wanted to talk about the astral compass that uh, was delivered to him the other day. We have a sketch and two photos from Edmonton. And uh, we have, um, I guess we'll ask Chris uh, Gaynor if there's any updates, <laughs> the massive world of what's going on um, with uh, James Webb, et cetera, and, and Hubble. Um, was there anybody else have anything this evening? Yeah, I've, I've got uh, kind of a quick description of uh, what I saw in my driveway and just a, a quick, quick photo. I wouldn't say it's a, an amazing photo, but just a quick overview photo. Great. Anybody else? And I was just going to just ask again about calendars and things like that to make sure that I've got everybody, I've got everybody that I need to. Right. Any sign of them yet? Um, no, but <laughs> <laughs> Phil Groff, Phil Groff today did say that he was he was pretty sure that they'd all been shipped from Ontario. Now that doesn't mean that we'll get them in BC and Victoria very soon, but no. at least that they're there. So. Yes. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, again, thanks for joining us this evening. <clears throat> so uh, with the, um, we've, um, and I actually haven't gone to check back to see what they've done with this. Actually, I sent the information about next week's presentation uh, to the national office. Uh, so hopefully it's in the events calendar as we are inviting people to join us uh, next week. Um, so the, the, um, when you go to connect, it will be a little different than um, it was tonight. So for example, tonight, when you, you clicked on the link, it just basically opened for you and here you, you know, and you arrived. Um, next week, we're gonna have to let you in. So, um, and that will be true for, I think everybody but me. Um, so I will start the meeting and then some people are going to um, help with the hosting duties um, we'll allow uh, Dr. Thurskin early so he can confirm he's connected and all that uh, and with Jeff. Um, and thanks again to Jeff for arranging this and Jeff is going to host the actual presentation portion. And um, yeah, and then we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, depending on how long things go, we may or may not have time for some, you know, our, our other things at the end. Um, any consensus on whether we want to even try to do that or should we just keep next week purely Dr. Thirsk and that's it? I think we can just kind of play it by ear, Chris. I mean, sure. if, sure, if there's a lot, a lot of active discussion, then we'll have to postpone yeah. other yeah. things. It'd be really good to get an update from Chris Gaynor next week too. Right. It's, it sounds like um, like Bob Thirsk uh, will commit to a half hour presentation in about 20 minute conversation. So you may actually end up with with half an hour, you know, for further discussion, 
um, now in previous presentations, he's also been willing to go longer. So I, I agree. I mean, let's let's just see how it goes. Sure, we'll play we'll play it by ear then, and we'll see what you know where we end up with. They just know sometimes, you know, presenters end up um, taking a bit longer, and then there could be a lot of questions too, depending on. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Okay, and Peter Jedeke has just put something in chat. I'll read that out in just a moment. So I was just going to say the other thing some of you may have noticed uh, for those who are Zoom aficionados that the um, link uh, has been staying the same from week to week to week because this is a recurring meeting. Next week is not part of that series. So do not try to use a link from a previous email. You must use the link from next week's email to get into next week's Astro Cafe. Just to make that point, um, what did Peter have to say to us here? Ah, yes, Montreal Center, David Levy on Wednesday the eighth. Okay, and that's so it's Wednesday, yes, and London Center on the Golden Meteorite on the seventeenth. Okay, thank you for sharing those. Um, are those in the? Um, do you know if they're in the um, calendar at Rask, uh, Peter? As far as I know, they are not. The uh... I haven't uh, I haven't seen the Montreal centers in the RAS calendar, but I've been getting the emails from Montreal Center directly. And London Center hasn't been able to uh, connect with uh, the national uh, promotion thing, so we we have that separately as well. But I can I can share details somehow if you guys want me to. Yeah. yeah. Peter, Peter, why don't you just forward the information to Chris, and Chris can kind yeah. of post it or get it posted. Yeah, we'll have time. It can go out at the, um, you know, in the footer of the um, next Astro Cafe if, if you're happy with that, Peter. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Great. Thank you for bringing that to our team. I have a question. The fellow who is at Western who's studying that uh, golden meteorite is a buddy of mine. Uh, would we like him to give a talk for, for us? Uh, which which one are you talking about, Randy? Which Phil McCausland. Yeah, yeah. So Phil's the one who's giving the talk to London Center next Friday. It won't be the whole hour, so it'll probably be a half a half hour presentation. Um, I, I mean, you know, Phil, he's certainly willing to give talks to other clubs, but we'd have to ask him directly if he's got time in the near future. Um, yeah. Certainly, it would be efficient for you just to pop into the London Center meeting. Very good. Yeah. So if you uh, if you have an interest in that topic, and uh, we won't overload the system uh, for the London Center, that would be uh, an opportunity. We, we'd love to have you. <laughs> Very good. Okay, Joe, uh, you uh, gathered some stuff on a quick trip to Antarctica, yeah. or not? Yeah, <laughs> I, I wish. <laughs> so does Fred Espinac. Yeah, Fred uh, was not happy. He uh, he flew all the way to Buenos Aires and had to fly all the way back home because the ship that he was going on was uh, was quarantined. So they had oh. issues. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I thought it would be kind of interesting just to quickly review. Um, what happened in Antarctica a few days ago. A total solar eclipse. This is an actual photo of the total solar eclipse at uh, totality in the title slide. So it's kind of cool. These um, <laughs> images are coming from I guess the well-funded observers, you might say, the uh, the NASA's and the Kecks of the world are have uh, real-time satellite connections to the rest of the world, so they can get these photos out. There were several um, private expeditions to Antarctica, either on cruise ships, uh, on aircraft, and. Uh, the uh, photographs or reports from those groups is still pending because, of course, they have to get back home before they can do, get a connection to the internet and uh, actually share their their um, ex excitement and experiences. 
And I'm afraid uh, Antarctica, of course, is infamous for bad weather and the bad weather kicked in in a lot of cases. So I, do, I expect some people spent a huge amount of money and were skunked. But anyway, let's get into Fred's uh, map, first of all, just to show you where this eclipse happened. So this is an um, orthographic uh, uh, map of uh, Antarctica. So you can see Antarctica here. This blue patch or blue track is the eclipse track. Um, the maximum was right here on this red star. And uh, the movie and uh, some of the photos I'm showing you are from this area in here. So um, this eclipse was just under two minutes long. You see the duration down here at the bottom of the screen, one minute, 54.4 seconds. And uh, the altitude of the sun was uh, 17 degrees. So given that combined with the weather, it was not terribly favorable for observing an eclipse, but nonetheless, there's the dedicated group that always have to do it. And so this is Union Station Glacier, and uh, these are the crew that I'll show you the video of in a minute um, that shot this time lapse and shot the actual real time video uh, from Union Station Glacier. This is a Chilean. Um, scientific outpost. And uh, this is the one, this is the feed that NASA used on their feed, which I publicized on Brass mm -hmm. Victoria Center's Facebook page. Um, I'm going to come back to, this is actually a video, I'm going to come back to this video and play it at the end because um, I wasn't too happy with the quality of the video inside my slideshow. So we'll skip that and just carry on to some of the pretty photos. Union Glacier, you can see a beautiful um, time series that was assembled rapidly. I was very impressed with this guy. He must have been right on top of things. Um, but a beautiful setting, you know, it's, it's just uh, otherworldly for sure. And uh, this was from a, another location. So this is where um, Keck has the bicep telescope, and this is also where the South Pole telescope is. I don't believe it's right on the South Pole, but it's close to it. It wouldn't be, if you look back at the map, you'll see that uh, the South Pole was actually not in the track. So I expect the South Pole Observatory will be in here somewhere. No, Joe, because it's not showing uh, totality. Oh, you're right. Okay, so it is South Pole. I the thing I love corrected. about this picture are the I stand uh, corrected. Yeah. The five people with their, their hands up in the sky. Yes. When you blow that picture up, you see they're all there, all happy. No doubt. Yeah. So you've got South Pole telescope and Keck. So that is the South Pole. That's cool. Yeah, that popped up on um on Twitter, I think uh, Martin popped it up there for me. Thank you very much, Martin. You're not going to see a photograph of an eclipse where the images are all horizontal like that too often. That's really cool. <laughs> Isn't You're that neat. Neat. That's, uh, that's the cool thing. It's a so straight many, line. There's so many subtleties to this photograph. <laughs> uh, my last uh, pretty picture actually is the uh, eclipse shadow. Now, this is captured by the Epic satellite that was. Uh, over the Indian Ocean at the time. So it's kind of cool. And uh, now I'm going to unshare if I can find Zoom. Oh boy. There we go. Stop share. Okay. Let's um, see if I can share my web browser. So I can play this using Safari and uh, YouTube. There we go. Okay, so this is um, the start of totality, you might say. And uh, this is just two minutes long. I'll let it play and I'll shut up.
this is what you would see if you were in Antarctica a few days ago. There are clever people who match the valleys in the in the uh, moon surface to the uh, Bailey's beads. Yes. Big prominence over here. Up top too. Yep. And lots of plasma streams coming off the sun. Big prominence building here. And the diamond ring as the eclipse ends. That's super cool, Joe. It's pretty neat. Not very long, that one. No. And I'll shut the NASA Edge feed off before it annoys us with all its strange shenanigans. You can see how close to the edge of the path they were too. Yeah. How the light just rolled along the top of the the moon shot of the moon. It didn't come yeah. in one side and go out the other. Yeah, we yeah. see where it was going to reappear and it was very yeah, pretty much just skimming across the yeah. It was it was the inverse of the lunar eclipse in some ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the path width was uh, uh, 419 kilometers. So that was uh, kind of an interesting eclipse um, for sure. Joe, People... how how was the length of that compared to the two, 2017? What was ours? Uh, we got at least another minute. I just forget now. No, um, it was it was in. We were almost right in the middle when we were in Wyoming. I think it's like two and, and a half minutes. Two and a half. Minutes, yeah, it was. It was just around two minutes in Oregon. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was yeah. a little over. Just a little over. So got got about twenty more seconds by driving another thousand kilometers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you're For watching, anyone who hasn't actually um, observed an eclipse yet, I mean that that video is shows you pretty well what you will see uh, with filters on and off, um, because once the moon covers the sun, you can actually take the solar your solar filters off and use binoculars um, that way and 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 you just have to be careful to put your filters back on, of course, when uh, totality ends. Once you see diamond ring show up at the end, then you, you need to protect your vision again. When you're there, they all last 30 seconds, no matter what the clock says. Oh yeah, the time just screams by. It's just hard to believe. <laughs> and of course, we were listening to nice music for that video, but um, as Michael and the rest of us know, um, human nature takes over during those events and people go can go a little crazy sometimes. <laughs> Yelling and screaming and dancing and unpredictable behavior seems to prevail. <laughs> did anybody, um, did it, was it recorded there what the um, air temperature was in those locations? Because it's, uh, of course it is getting into the peak of summer down there, but it still wouldn't be very warm, I don't think. No, I was wondering about that as well, but I didn't have time to look it up. Yeah, they're fairly far south too compared to the coast where it's a little more mild, like where Julia was. But it was actually above zero when she was down there in January. <laughs> Are there many researchers down there in the summertime or are they just maintenance? Almost There's uh, a surprising number of amount of research being yep. done down there. It, yep. it's, it's just incredible. Yeah. It's fairly continuous, isn't it, too? There are people there all the time, I thought. Yeah. Uh, 
it gets pretty sparse when it gets, gets midwinter. But uh, yeah, well, because you can get like Alberta and Scott Base are still busy, but uh, anywhere else on the continent, it's very hard to get to. Yeah, uh, be, because the cold temperatures make it hard to fly anywhere. You know, there's Ken Bora here based in the Northwest Territories is one of the few that can get down in there. So they've done rescues down there. Yeah. Yes, they have. Using, a, using their ancient aircraft that still yeah. work in very cold weather. And the only other yeah. aircraft that are useful down there, I think, are twin otters. Yeah. But yeah. it's daytime all day. <laughs> this time of the year, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The other time of the year, it's night. <laughs> <laughs> So when you can't get there is when it's dark. <laughs> when you, or when it's stormy. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing with that, that horizontal line of the eclipse, of course, over the course of 24 hours, it would go all the way around the same height above the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you're- Great line the, parallel to the horizon all the way around. <laughs> yeah, that for that one at Antarctica on the, yep. uh, yeah, what would be the, on the 20th, I guess. Right? Just inscribe a circle all the way around. So the next total solar eclipse is 2024, in case anyone has forgotten that date. So mark it on your calendar. <laughs> See you in Mazatlan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very good. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah. Randy, you were you got possession of the Astro Compass. Yes. Um, can you pin me? This is gonna be a uh, a um, you know show of the real item. Can you make me big for everybody? Yeah. So I have to start off by my uh, marking how I mark uh, the uh, Astro Cafe this month. So Delicious are, as always. You didn't, you didn't mail them out to everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I felt very fortunate. So, um, yeah, Lori came by yesterday and I missed you. I'm so sorry, Lori. But um, she brought the uh, the Compass Astro, and uh, there's enough information on there that I could Google it and find out about it. And uh, just before the meeting, Lori, uh, we were wondering: Is it Frank Younger who, who whose estate it comes from? Correct. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so it's absolutely beautiful machine. Uh, there are some YouTubes. There's a very good YouTube where this pilot who's flying from a Kaluit um, is showing how to use it. And the application is, um, you know, every airplane has a compass in it, but when you're very far north, uh, the magnetic field is almost vertical and it varies with a very short time period. Um, so basically when you're very far north, you cannot use a uh, magnetic compass and you don't want to trust any one piece of equipment. So you, you have a gyro compass, but you don't necessarily want to trust it without calibrating it. And so it looked like it actually is still in use in that application if you're flying around in the uh, in the far north. Anyway, it is um, it's a sundial in reverse, and uh, where if you know your position and the time, then you can um, use the uh, a sundial to figure out which way is north. Okay, so what do we have? We have a um, dial that is used to change the latitude. So this is if you're at the equator and as you get steeper and steeper. Oh, no, no, that was, that was at the pole. That's right. So, you know, like we just saw in Antarctica, the sun, as it goes around, would have a constant uh, declination, right? Altitude over the um, over over the ground, but um, we are going to be at 
49, so somewhere around there. And I, I downloaded a um, owner's manual and they basically say, you only do it to a degree. You're not trying to get better precision than that. Okay, and then you um, sit this on a specially built pedestal in your cockpit. And the one they showed in the video, there was one on the co-pilot side and one on the pilot side, depending on where the sun is. So they were flying east and it was on the co-pilot's um, bench. So you, you put it there and you level it with these dials here. And I guess you just fly the airplane as steady as you can while you do the measurement. And I guess you try to do it as quickly as possible. And then um, you uh, look up in your trusty almanac, what is the uh, LHA, the local hour angle of your object, usually the sun, but it could be the moon, it could be a planet, it could be anything. And you turn this guy, so it says push to turn, but in this one, you don't have to. In the video, I saw they actually did have to push to turn this, and that turns around this axis here. So you set it to what the almanac says at your time, where the sun would be. And then there's another dial, which is the declination. So, you know, at um, the spring and autumn equinoxes, you're at zero and the sun moves north or south, depending on the, uh, the date. So you look that up and then, um, it's kind of clever. You can either just see the um, sun projecting on this plastic screen. So you can just see through it if it's a bright sun, but you also have, let's see if I can get this at the camera. You have this little lens here and a sight over here. So that's how you would sight a star. And it's really just a matter of knowing where the star is in right ascension and uh, and declination, and then seeing where you see it and the difference between your um, the the two is going to tell you your um, no 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 you know your longitude. So then what you're doing is you're finding what your bearing is. That's that's how it works. Okay, so I don't have any experience with this, but I do have lots of experience with this because I use this for my work, orienting the directions of rock samples that I collect. So um, as some of you know, I study paleomagnetism. I study the uh, fossil magnetism in rocks and Many rocks that you pick up are so magnetic that you can't use a magnetic compass. So as long as the sun is out, what you do is um, you want to know what direction this line is. So you, you, you level it up so it has a bubble level. And it's, again, it's a sundial in reverse. You set your latitude of this plane and this plane if you've got the shadow of the sun pointing at the right time this plane will be parallel with the equator and this line here the gnomon will be parallel with the um axis of the earth and so um when i'm in the field i actually set my clock my watch to solar time Solar time is the time such that at noon solar time, the sun is due south. And you get that from knowing your longitude. And so here, um, the reference longitude for Pacific time is 120 west. 
and we're at 125 or so. And so um, it takes the sun four times five degrees, so 20 minutes to get from the reference longitude for our time zone out to where we live. So you put your clock back another 20 minutes or whatever it is, depending on your longitude. And then there's a correction for the date, okay? Because the sun leads or lags the average time by up to 15 minutes, okay? And that's something you look up. It's called the equation of time. And so I set my clock and I say, oh, it's 2.35. And I turn this until the shadow from the gnomon onto, oh, it's very hard to read, but there's the hours of the day. And it's very easy. It's just 15 minutes per hour. 24 times 15 is 360 degrees. 24 hours times 15 minutes. So it's, it's uh, 15 degrees uh, per hour. And um, when you've got the shadow in the right place, then this arrow is pointing north. And then you read what, your, what the direction is just on that dial. In the same way that the magnetic arrow of a compass is pointing north, and it's the case that can be in any direction. The arrow is always pointing north, plus the uh, what's called the magnetic declination, which is very different than an astronomic declination. Um, and so this will be always pointing north, and it's this um, table which moves around to whatever you're trying to, to, uh, to point at. And it's essentially the same thing as that beautiful astro compass. Um, so why do they not use this, and why do they use that? I guess I should find out. Maybe the other one is more precise. Where do you put a rock sample? Where is a rock sample? The oh, rock. So, so we we take we have this. Um, it's called a coring drill. So it's a um, cylinder with um, diamonds impregnated in brass at the end, and you go into the rock, and then I push a tube into there, and I have a little leveling table on top of that, and I put this on top, and I measure the direction into the the direction that I drilled into the uh, outcrop. Now, Peter, you said you know something about the astro compass. Can, well, can you tell us? not much. It's not a magnetic compass, as far as I understand. The no, no, no. The, the astro compass astro using the sun. Is, yeah, using the uh, or, uh, the uh, objects in the sky, the sky. And, it is almost similar use as a uh, sextant in the sense, except you don't work with the horizon. But as far as I understand, they were only used in warplanes, like the bombers, like the uh, Sky Marser and the planes like that. They, uh, when you mentioned sitting next to the pilot, it could could be a a backup for the pilot nowadays if you as far now this one was definitely used for the war planes uh in in war and the other thing uh, on the box it says compass astro <laughs> in, in, in the terms seem to be astro compass nowadays but i think at that time they used compass astro they probably caution the navy naval and compass whatever so anyhow, and as far as uh, you can see it on the box, I think Bors, Bors, uh, made by Bors, B-O-E-S. Yeah. And I think they were in Philadelphia. And uh, uh, like you, you explained it already, it's a little bit different than a sextant in the sense. And also uh, where you're using it for astronomy. astronomy. And I also I have an old, uh, uh, what do you call it? Theolodite at home here. So th that was used for surveying, land surveying, and you know, take ang take take angles and things like that. So it's a little bit similar uh, th this this guy. Anyhow, that's, that's, that's all. Called. And the last week I wanted to, 
phone phone uh, talk to to the people I could to get in because I I have lived in New Zealand uh, for a while and I learned astronaut navigation in New Zealand and it was a different uh, we used uh, the aircraft system but uh, uh, still in sextant but all the manuals were aircraft uh, uh, documentation we used but I don't know much more about that I I have used the uh, uh, years ago I went to Alaska with our sailboat and I used the sextant a number of times but also we had the I think the Delta system was the for navigation uh, it was a triangular system it was uh, uh, by by radio so for a backup anyhow that's a call thank call. you peter yeah, I, I have I, to say I, that this has white numbers for the north hemisphere and red numbers for the south hemisphere so you can use it over the whole globe yeah yeah that was the purpose for the airplanes i guess yeah I, I had a very good friend, he was much older, but he was a navigator on the Lancaster during the war. I would attack, I would, he would, uh, would probably give him all the information. I know he was sitting down at, in the dome and with the, all the instruments, he told me. I didn't say any more about it. So, anyhow, that's fast. That's enough. <laughs> Are there any pilots in our community here? They talked in the documentation about swinging the airplane and that you can uh, make yeah. corrections as you go around the circle for you know magnetic anomalies in your plane. And they said, you should be able to do it in 40 minutes. So yeah, you, you do that on the ground. It, you, you find a, a remote spot on the tarmac and you would run the airplane around in a circle and you would mark your, your compass because the runway would have a true north marking and you'd swing around and that would give you the errors in the compass. Because there's, there's stuff in the aircraft that's metal that would cause the trunk compass not to read true. So you had to swing this, about, about once a month, the guys at the flying club would swing the, the aircraft. Okay. I and had then, a plane too, and we did the same thing. Yeah. You you sat on the runway and you moved the plane around in a very tight circle at the end of the runway where the markings were. And yeah. every now and then you had to tune it up again. Yeah. Yeah. And how much were the corrections? How how many degrees would there Ooh, three, four, five degrees? It was okay. sufficient. It depends on what there was in the in the cockpit. <laughs> Yeah. What instruments and stuff were in the cockpit that would cause the compass to deviate from, from true north. And if you wanted yeah. to, you could do it while flying in 40 minutes with this machine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and the reason you can't use a directional gyro is uh, it will precess on you. If you get any violent uh, turbulence in the aircraft, the gyro won't hold its space because of uh, precession forces, it'll, it'll shift. Mm -hmm. they the were, same thing they has to be were, done with the uh, uh, ship. Uh, it depends on um, how the uh, how the, the magnetic field is intersecting the magnetic components of the uh, the vessel or yep. the aircraft that yep. uh, affect yep. how it will distort the uh, the compass. So you might be in the same uh, magnetic field, but it'll be different at say forty five degrees or fifty degrees or whatever uh, whatever it else whatever the uh, the angle changes to. The local Navy people were doing that of a scar mold for the Navy vessel, so they turn around to connecting yep. that compass. There's full of metal on the on board ship, of course. <laughs> yeah. Of course, a lot of that goes away with GPS. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, when I heard from people from Europe going to navigation school, they don't learn using text and anymore. All of these depend on electronics. The good school, they do, they still do it because if you want a backup, his electronics is out. This happened with the plane where we were traveling in, uh, coming back to, we were hit by lightning. And our navigation brought out, I heard later, after we landed, he must have had a backup somehow. He had maybe the same 
astral compass. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we were flying at night as well, so I don't know what happened. But we we came home safe. We we were, we were shaking like anything. We got hit. Well, thanks very much for uh, showing us that. Yeah, and as you find out more about it, you can update us with what you might. I guess you're going to keep it for a while, are you, and do some stuff with it? <laughs> I, Lori, what is our plan with this machine? Um, all Elizabeth Griffin wanted was that um, uh, um, Frank Younger's name be uh, be associated with it, no matter what happened with it. So, um, if it goes to, you know, if it uh, if it, it gets put somewhere as a as an artifact, or if we want to, you know, have it somewhere, just maybe we can make some sort of a little plaque on, you know, a plaque on the on the on the box or something like that that said that it was donated by Frank Younger's widow to to the RASC. Or wonderful. EFD, yeah, yeah, one, wherever, wherever, just up to the center. So, <laughs> yeah. And we'll do take a picture and give it to uh, to her. Yes. Once it has this plaque on it, very good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, it'd be interesting to learn more if you uh, master it. That must have been <laughs> fun using it in an aircraft, which was maybe in some turbulence. Oh yeah. <laughs> None of that was easy. Those navigators were special people, I'll tell you. Yeah, well, I think you must have done a lot of practicing with it. That's all I can say. Isn't that Perhaps I'll quickly share just one little thing here um, that uh, we actually, they, modern cruise ships actually still do um, sextant yep. practice. So you oh. can see two uh, cruise ship officers here practicing. Uh, a sighting at noon from uh, top deck. So hold it upside down. Hold it the other way. <laughs> it, it does. It does still happen, and they still make sure they know how to do it. <laughs> Just in case anyone was wondering. Yeah. Very neat. Well, it's funny because you can rely too much on technology because it was uh, quite an interesting story in the north, and very embarrassing for the uh, crew involved. But. Um, and it must have been, I think it was in the early 1990s, maybe the very late 1980s, they, um, uh, the jet took off from Yellowknife bound for Cambridge Bay and off they went. Uh, but they put the wrong destination code in just to uh, <laughs> foreshadow. And um, so they flew and it turned out the destination code was about the same distance as Cambridge Bay. So they um, got to their destination and were told to you know, come down and contact to the flight services station to land. And um, they were kind of wondering why they were looking at trees because they'd flown to Churchill, Manitoba instead of Cambridge Bay. And they'd gone about 90 degrees off. So instead of flying almost north from Yellowknife, they'd flown east and hadn't noticed. So, <laughs> so anyway. yeah, it, There's no roads to follow there. <laughs> yeah, no. no. But, IFR, yes. Yes. They all, I follow roads, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So anyway, wrong way Corrigan's claim to fame when he uh, wound up uh, trying to do a transatlantic run to Ireland and wound up in California. Yeah. California. <laughs> exactly the same thing, flew a reciprocal on his uh, compass. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so I'll, um, let's see here, put up the, share the screen here and we can have a look at the Edmonton photos. Uh, where are we here? So, yeah. From the beginning, here we are. So, yeah, if you, if you can expand the photo, I'll I'll do the the verbal part here. Sure. Um, me, um, okay, hold on. So the second. first the first one is from Arnold Rivera, and and this is a, a shot of Comet Leonard. In in, in uh, Arnold writes he he'd seen lots of reports of this comet the past week and a few days, with some speculation from some comet observers that maybe it was fragmenting. Anyway, he checked out the uh, comet websites to find out what the magnitude was uh, and pro proposed. And it was supposed to be visual of 6.7. So we decided to see if we could catch an image of it in his area. So he went out to the Blackfoot staging area, which is about an hour east of Edmonton. And uh, he noted that the, the comet and would be close to Messier 3. 
So that's his photograph of the of the comet Leonard next to Messier to be taken on the third. Mm. So not being a photographic type, Bella Beltran, Berta Beltran from Edmonton Center also, she, she writes a narrative here. And what she, we'll see with hers is a sketch that she did. Uh, she said that the sky was finally forecast to be clear in pre-dawn Edmonton. So she got up at 4.30 in the morning to try and see the comet from her backyard. She's not sure sure that it was above the tree line, but she got lucky as it was. She said, I first tried to locate it with binoculars, nine by 63s, but wasn't able to see it. So seeing it was within reach of her scope, she set up her little four inch refractor and star hopped to it from Arcturus with a 40 mil eyepiece, which gives about 3.7 degree field of view. So she was able to see it, though it was very faint. It was nicely framed by a set of six stars two parallel sets, lines of threes. She said, the only way I was able to see it was by, and I like this, was by moving my scope slightly from left to right that would bring this faint fuzzy into view. Uh, she said, the seeing one goes, but the transparency might not have been particularly good. Um, she says, faint, but not well-defined nucleus and a tail pointed to the bright star at the top. She thought the tail was kind of spread, but it might be the seeing she wasn't able to see the faint stuff where it goes narrower. Uh, she, what's it, what you're seeing is her logbook page with a sketch. Uh, so she says, this is a testament that this comet can be seen from the city with a scope, although it's really faint. <laughs> so I thought, it, I thought a few people would like to see the sketch from somebody who is ardent observer to get up at 4.30 in the morning. Yeah, good for her. I love it. And, and the last one is from Arnold Rivera. He says, while well, waiting for Comet Leonard to rise on Friday morning, I went out to check the telescope and camera setup. She's got, he's got this uh, uh, astrograph. Uh, he said it needed a bright target because he wanted to do some plate solving. So this is the Rosette Nebula. And inside Rosette is NGC 2244. That's the open cluster of stars in the middle. So he'd, we'd seen a picture of this that he'd done before with his, with his scope, but he was using PhD2 guiding this time and he wanted to increase the exposures to 60 seconds. So what you see here is uh, 10 frames, 10 times 60 seconds, total integration time. Uh, and uh, that's what he ends up with. So pretty nice image of the rosette. Very clear. So that's uh, that's it from Edmonton. Okay, thanks for sending those along, Dave. Um, Chris Gaynor. Okay, just uh, just a couple of things here. Um, the. Uh, um, the James Webb Telescope is uh, just completed fueling operations. And this is something that sets it apart from Hubble because Hubble doesn't have any fuel on board. It uses, uh, um, what the hell is the term? Momentum wheels uh, and uh, gyroscopes. But uh, 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 Webb is going to use uh, little thrusters to move around. And so in the last few days, it's been filled with 42 gallons of hydrazine and 21 gallons or nearly 80 liters of dinitrogen tetroxide oxidizer. And uh, now some of these, uh, some of this will be used during the first month when it's going up to its operating uh, altitude and then uh, um, but uh, there'll be smaller thrusters which will keep it uh, pointed in the right direction. So um, uh, once it's on station, so uh, it's still uh, it's still not on top of its uh, rocket yet. But I think that's that's the next thing is that it will be uh, moved uh, uh, into another building and then put on top of the. Uh, Ariane 5 rocket, and then at about uh, 7.30, 7.40, I think, uh, or 
actually 4.30 or 4.40 in the morning of December 22nd, that's when it's supposed to be launched. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing new uh, with Hubble, uh, except for something right here. And that's uh, this. My Hubble book has finally arrived, at least uh, a, a copy for me. And uh, so uh, uh, I'm now working on getting some copies for you. So, uh, um, and uh, the, this book, because it's published by NASA, is kind of a different thing. You just can't go onto Amazon and order it, at least until there's uh, some used copies floating around. Uh, so, um, uh, so I'm going to uh, see if I can get some shipped up here and then uh, have, have them sold by the uh, friends of the DAO. And, and uh, I think it's just a little less complicated uh, in, uh, if you're in Canada to have it done that way. And I'm also having some discussions and this is for Peter and folks like him. Um, uh, and and Dave uh, to uh, to have the RESC National uh, uh, selling them through their uh, 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 distribution uh, the uh, e store. So anyway, I'm still kind of working on that, um, um, and and so unfortunately, it's going to be kind of late for for Christmas. I think. We're thinking about uh, doing it next, doing most of distribution next year sometime. But anyway, it is it is here, or it does exist as a as a printed book, and uh, it looks great. and uh, And I'm hoping everybody will uh, will have some uh, soon. And of course, I'll be putting a copy in our uh, uh, library as soon as I can. So that's all I have to say. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Do you, how many did they print? You know, I I actually don't know what the exact number is. They, uh, uh, you know, it will be widely uh, distributed in the states, and I think they wanted the, the they wanted to make it available in in reference libraries all over the all over the country. This is uh, this is part of the. Uh, the the idea behind uh, you know funding this this project you know funding me to write it and getting it produced and everything else. Peter, you raised your hand. Chris, can I ask a question about JWST? Have you heard if there's a website, presumably a website, where they'll have like literally up to the minute uh, reports uh, in the 29 days of terror, so that we can literally follow every one of the 140. Critical steps. Uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, I don't I don't know, and I wonder a little bit about it because you know the the information about the fueling just came out today, but it's actually been going on for a week. So uh, that kind of signals to me that they may not be totally forthcoming about things uh, before or, uh, as they happen. But uh, uh, I know they, uh, uh, when I was giving one of these other updates, there was actually quite a nifty little website that was, uh, uh, had some films of things of the, the 29 days of terror and all that stuff. But, uh, um, but, you know, I don't know what that, what that will mean when it happens, you know. Uh, the launch, of course, the launch itself will be covered on NASA TV, and and perhaps even uh, the the media will cover it live. Um, but uh, I will keep an eye out for that, and if if uh, if I can get enlightened in any way, uh, you know, I'll bring that up. You know, when we when we meet, or you know, the next opportunity I have to to uh, talk about this. Possibly next week, we'll see. Thank you.
Well, Chris, I have a comment about JWST. I just looked up, it's only going to last five and a half to 10 years, unlike Hubble. That's right. Boy. And, and, and this is one of the reasons, in, in, uh, because it's using uh, these, uh, uh, these thrusters rather than the momentum wheels that, that Hubble does. And uh, so uh, uh, I'm hoping, uh, you know, sometimes they, they set these times and manage to figure out how to stretch them for much longer. But, uh, but uh, first things first, let's, let's see them get the damn thing on station and all unfold it and everything else. And then, uh, then maybe we can sweat about how long it's gonna be. But yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a limited time. Uh, uh, of course, unlike, unlike Hubble, uh, one of the downsides of Hubble being where it is, is that uh, you know, for major portions uh, of an orbit, it's not necessarily viewing. Uh, whereas um, JWST will be able to, uh, you know, just be working all the time, or that's my understanding anyway. Interesting. Yeah, well, let's hope it all goes well. And, uh, yeah. But uh, quite, uh, quite an interesting project. Thanks again, and thanks for keeping us updated. Um, David Lee. You had some things. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I, I unfortunately didn't. Uh, I missed the mark uh, dovetailing with uh, Edmonton's photos, but I've got my own uh, comet pictures. So um, I did send some email. I uh, tried on December third, the same night, uh, the same night that the um, Edmonton photos showed when it was next to uh, M three, uh, but. When I went out uh, onto the driveway, the, uh, the it, it was sort of clear, uh, but not totally. And then at around four o'clock, uh, the cloud around the horizon layer started to rise, so right over the area. So so that was a that was a no show for me. Uh, but on I think it was a Saturday night. I think Sid mentioned to me that it might be clear. So I went out. Uh, I guess it must have been Sunday morning. And it was still positioned above Arcturus in this direction here. And I managed to get a quick uh, image of it here. You can see Arcturus here and, um, and the comet here. And you, you'll see that I'm not tracking on the comet. So uh, you actually see it, it's actually moving. So the comet head is actually moving. I think within the hour it had moved that much. But I'll show you the completed uh, image. Um, so I was able to, um, and I know Bill, Bill was asking, I know <laughs> Joe was asking about the color. So I, I managed to get all the color back uh, when I finally stacked. Now I did do some culling. I had some really bad gradients uh, in the image uh, because of the clouds that were going over. When I blinked all the separate images, I could see the clouds actually moving over and it really wasn't that transparent uh, sky either. So I was kind of lucky to be able to even get this. Uh, I did take my original 43 images and culled it down to 35 images. And I was able to, to get this. And I know Bill, Bill asked me whether I could see some of these other objects. And uh, uh, 40, uh, 5466 is just a bit of a smudge there. And M3 is this little guy here. So I just kind of blew it up. So. Even with this, this is about almost 20 minutes of exposure uh, is not enough to bring these out. So uh, uh, this is actually also what I could consider a wide field view. So this is a 70 millimeters. So most people like the shot that we saw from Edmonton would have been shooting with a, a longer lens or, or a telescope. And then they would have had a view like this, but this is quite a wide field. So. That, that's, that was my little bit of fun for about an hour until uh, I started getting very, very cold. And my, when my hands started to stick to my metal tripod legs, I knew it was time to go inside. Oh, oh, nicely done. <laughs> yeah, thank you. David? So I have yes, a question. Thanks for sharing. There are people who take a bunch of photos and they kind of track on the, com the comet and the track 
separately on the stars and they put them back together. And yeah, I have, I, have, I have not I have not done that with this, but you can. Uh, I, you know, to be honest, I don't think I really have enough data to do that, but I, I'll, I'll try it anyways. Uh, it would give but, me an but what is going on? How, how are they actually doing that? Well, there's a couple of ways of doing it. Uh, there's uh, mo most of the time you want to sort of remove all the stars. So then whatever you're left with, you sort of work with that and sort of enhance the, the comets uh, stuff. And you could also, uh, at that point, uh, align against the head of the comet. So you don't get this kind of weird uh, line effect here. Then you would just get like a, a singular head and then you'd get the tail and possibly with some detail. Uh, and then you would overlay the stars back back again. And that's that's all you would get that. So it's all done digitally, Randy. Dave. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff to do. It, it, it was really unfortunate. Like I was hoping to make this a visual uh, observation, but I couldn't see it with the binoculars. So I grabbed the tracker and I grabbed the, grabbed the camera and I was able to see it with just using the device, using the camera. David, what's the object to the right in your photograph, just this above the C slash two of Comet? Oh, that's that's the actual comet. I just this is a blow up. Ah, okay. This is an inset. I didn't I didn't put the arrow in, but I I just blew it up because I did the same thing for the uh, for M three as well because it's really hard to tell that's M three. That makes. But when you Thank when you. you blow it up, you can actually see it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to disappoint Bill. Bill Bill was probably going to tell me what M three. So so I decided to blow it up. No, I really Thank like you. that. I like yeah. the representation of 5466 too, because it's yeah, a ghost. it's just a little it's a, smudge. It's a ghost right of a globular. It's kind of one that's well, it's in the finest NGC, I think it is. It's kind mm -hmm. of like this challengey thing, and it really sort of shows how it's they're not all dense. Yeah, yeah. what's what's interesting about M NGC 5466 is the angular size is similar to M3, but it's mm -hmm. way way dimmer. Yeah, you can see that actually. Yeah, there you go. You can sort of see that. Yeah, even the even there's M three right there, and there's uh, fifty four sixty six down here. I I'm actually constantly amazed by what you can actually do with a tracker and a photographic lens, because uh, you put it together and you get uh, lots of photons. Uh, Lori, you had a question. I was asking the same thing as Oliver. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually curious about the stars too. And and the other thing is um, the really bright stars start to get quite large. And uh, uh, you can see these uh, these two stars are part of Boades as well. Th this is the bottom of the ice cream cone. Yeah. So if you see it like this, this is the bottom part of Boades here. And then of course the ice cream cones over here. The ice cream is off, off the screen. Laura, you have a question again? Did Laurie have a question? There? No. 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 Okay. okay. We're good. Great. Oh, oh, I, I'll, I'll also put into the chat um, the virtual telescope uh, uh, viewing. They're going to uh, broadcast this uh, tomorrow, tomorrow night at uh, eight o'clock. So I'll, I'll throw that into the chat. Great. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everybody who's contributed bits to the chat there. We've got some interesting things tonight. So uh, maybe we can try and capture those for the uh, kind of journal that goes along or the blog that goes along with the um, recording. Yeah, so there, there it is in the chat. And I found the uh, JWST launch website fairly quickly. So it's, I put it in the chat too. Yeah, thank you. Worth a look. Uh, David, is that uh, launch? Is that sorry? Is the uh, uh, virtual telescope? Is that at eight o'clock Eastern time? Therefore, five o'clock our time? Uh, no, I've done the translation. It's uh, okay. four o'clock. Four o'clock UTC. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's actually uh, they show it as Wednesday, but it's our Tuesday. <laughs> our Tuesday at uh, eight. It, okay. Just just check at eight o'clock tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks again. Um, Laurie, you 
want to do update us again about calendars um, or yeah i just just wanted to ask if there's anybody else online that wants some i have now um i've now got um uh, a full 30 have been have been asked for so i still have 10 more and um uh, so if anybody else still wants a calendar um, i am just hoping that they're going to be here before christmas that we can get them out to you uh, so would you please um uh, either put it in the chat just right now if you'd like an extra one or another one um and uh or email me at roche r-o-c-h-e dot lori l-a-u-r-i at gmail.com thank you and they'll be 16 dollars a piece i i i'm pretty sure unless the unless the shipping becomes enormous and we have to pay a huge amount for shipping, we think they'll be $16 a piece. Oh. Yeah. And let's hope we, uh, we do get them at some point, as you yes. say, <laughs> probably Lori, in Calgary or something. Hope so. L L Lori, I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, will the center of the universe gift store be open for kind of Christmas kind of sales and stuff? Um, I've, I just actually talked to Amy uh, today and it's, it won't be open in person, but it will be open online. Yes. Uh, mm. Yes. Things are definitely open online. You can go in there. In fact, I bought two things today <laughs> online. <laughs> and um, uh, so you can just go on the website and. and so do they, and do up. they mail them to you or do you do curb pickup? If you are in, if you are in Victoria, we will deliver them free to you. Wow. If you are anywhere else, we'll have to ship them. We'll have to ship them out. So, but we will, we will do a direct, uh, a direct um, uh, delivery to you if you're here for free. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And a good thing there is those items, those are items on hand. So they don't have to get here either. Right? They're already here. That's, that's right. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're doing that. But, but uh, Chris has, uh, Chris Gaynor, as, as Chris said, um, he's extremely kindly um, offered us uh, to have the book, have his book as a FD, FDAO fundraiser. And what we're going to look at is having Chris um, as our main speaker for Astronomy Day in, uh, in May, and he will come and sign the books. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, and as what we've said, the signed copies are completely priceless, right? Entirely. So, yeah. Well, there might not be all that many printed copies anyways, you know, in the global scheme of things. So they but may be they, quite yeah, valuable. They <laughs> may be quite valuable. That's right. Yes. So hopefully we'll be able to get enough for um, for everybody and that it will be a fundraiser for us. Yes. And this is the limited first edition. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Um, so I think um, I think that was all I had on my list. Does anybody else have anything for this evening? Well, hearing none, um, thanks for everybody for attending. And um, reminder next week, do not uh, use a regular Astro Cafe link, use the one that you'll be sent uh, on Saturday. Um, and reminder that um, we will have to let you in and um, we will have a team standing by to do that. So, um, and we will endeavor to make sure that Victoria Center members um, get in if we get swamped with people attending. But uh, okay. there's no guarantees because Zoom only will allow 100 people there. So um, we hope that not that many people show up, but hopefully we'll get some extra people. <laughs> and we'll see how it goes our first attempt at uh, a bigger event. So, anyways, so that's all I have. Again, last call. Anybody have anything else? Thank and, you very much. And a few Thank of you. us will be talking on Wednesday. So we'll see you at 8 on Wednesday. The team that are working on next week. Oh, I did. I forgot, Chris. Beginners uh, Sig, getting oh, okay. started astronomy tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, okay. Yeah, very good. But will we be finished by eight so that we can go on the virtual telescope and watch the uh, watch Leonard? Leonard? Oh, we might we might watch it together. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we could. Yeah. Very good. We, well, we have a Zoom, Zoom party. Good night. <laughs> yeah, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.